The use of undercover police officers to help gain a confession is both controversial and complicated. Unless conducted under strict rules and guidelines, such confessions can lead to evidence that's inadmissible in court. However, in 2007, such a ploy was successfully used to help convict Canada's most prolific serial killer. A pig farmer by trade, he lured women who worked as sex workers in Vancouver's red light district to his farm. There he imprisoned them, tortured them, and ultimately murdered them. Their bodies were either fed to his pigs or put through an industrial meat grinder. A search of his property found an asthma inhaler belonging to one of the missing victims and led to him being arrested on suspicion of murder. But he refused to cooperate at all with the police. As a result, an undercover Mountie posed as a fellow cellmate. And as they spoke, the suspect began to brag about the full extent of his crimes. Who is this killer who confessed? after being caught in a trap? Robert Picton. On February 2nd, 2002, Canadian police arrested Vancouver farmer Robert Picton on suspicion of murder. For years, rumors had circulated about strange comings and goings on Picton's pig farm. But as he was led away in handcuffs, few would have expected that those rumours would lead to something far more grave. The eccentric, scruffy farmer being labelled as one of the deadliest serial killers in history, and that the pigs would prove to have been his unwitting accomplices. Robert Picton was a Canadian pig farmer who made the Texas Chainsaw Massacre look like an attraction at Disneyland. A rural farm in the dead of night. Dog barks and owl screeches. People down at the local bar playing pool, having a smoke. Rumours circulate. Picton's killing people. Somebody out there the other day saw a corpse, what they thought was a corpse hanging from a barn. It's unbelievable. No, it can't be Bob, it can't be Bob, you're missing something. Bodies in freezers, gossip, barroom gossip. The police probably got to hear about it, but their people are drunk. These are rural, crude people, they're not intelligent. They've got nothing else to talk about. So despite the fact that Picton's doing all these things, nobody's really taking him seriously. He's a farmer, he's crude, he's living on a small holding, it's a ghostly place to go at night. Wouldn't go there on your own if I were you, but it's rumours. Nobody can believe the truth. A hedonistic, degenerate, a lacking in conscience predator. Picton came from a long line of, of pig farmers, uh, and they were very well known in the community. And as such, they had a lot of influence with everyone from public officials including the police right across the local politicians. There was nothing about Picton that made him appear to be what we later found out he was. Yeah, he didn't look after himself very well. Uh, his standards of hygiene were not great um, and he wasn't really a very gregarious character but People looked on him as an eccentric. I mean, he was a pig farmer. He was out in a big isolated plot, working away and working very long hours every day. People respected that. He wasn't a very bright lad. So he had problems with, with people, he had problems with women particularly. 
But what was interesting was that his family sold off quite a lot of the land in Vancouver that they owned for, for building houses. So the family became very wealthy by, by farming uh, standards. And he was quite wealthy in his own, in his own rights. And this was, a, this was a cause of many of his problems because he then, uh, once he became known to be wealthy, had lots and lots of hangers on. People were starting to become friendly with him, they were tapping him up for money, and he was getting a lot of attention because he had money. There was another side to Picton. Yeah, he, was, he had a gregarious, fun-loving side as well as the isolated one. And he would regularly hold barn dances, bikers, lots of women, a lot of drink. Uh, and by all accounts, they were quite rowdy events. He would almost turn it into some kind of club um, which would attract young people, which was kind of just really flies to a spider's web. Picton was even known locally for using prostitutes and he had a particular penchant for indigenous women who were prostitutes uh, and this was something he never hid from anyone. And these women, these indigenous prostitutes, were known to visit Picton's farm in large numbers and yet when large numbers of these indigenous women started to go missing, and we're talking about 50 ultimately, the police didn't want to make any connection. Picton had been on the police radar before. A few years prior to his arrest for murder, he'd been brought in for questioning on suspicion of assaulting a young woman, threatening and cutting her with a knife. I turned around, I didn't take the knife away from her. I did not take the knife away from her. I aimed it to her and I knifed her twice. I did do that. I admit I did that. That's one thing I didn't, shouldn't have done. So you've never taken any of the prostitutes back to your trailer? Not since this incident, no. Hey. But before that incident? No, 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 no. With no charges brought, Picton was set free to kill and kill again. I'm here with Professor Michael Brooks to try and comprehend why so many opportunities to bring Picton to justice were missed. For so many women in a relatively small area to continue to go missing, surely the... Why aren't questions being asked? Why aren't the... But again, sex working, it's loan working. You're never quite sure who the last client was, perhaps, or where they are or where they've been. And so they're extremely vulnerable. And the more they stray away from a more supportive group, the greater the risk to them. He would have known the law enforcement officers. They would have been his customers at the local butcher shop. Um, he would have known them on a daily basis, uh, waving to them in the street. Oh, oh there, goes, uh, there goes Mr. Picton, um, covered in blood again. He's been slaughtering his pigs. And there were reports that he was up to no good. He re reports that people were disappearing on his small holding. But when the police went there, what could they find? Pigs, meat, nothing. Until one small item in the inhaler from one of his victims was found, which linked that inhaler to one of the missing women. And that's when the police started to take him seriously. What was interesting about him was he had a friend who he asked uh, this, this, this female friend to go with him while he went and picked up a, a, a prostitute. The prostitute wasn't very keen to get in the car and travel out to his farm, which was a fair way away. But when she said, oh, I'm with him, the prostitute was quite happy to get into the vehicle. He drove them back to the farm. The friend went off to her room. He took the prostitute into another room and then killed her. The friend came down and actually saw him with the victim. And she didn't report it. And this is unusual because usually if people see someone having committed a murder, um, they, re they, they panic and they report it. She didn't. And it turned out the reason she didn't report it was she was blackmailing him for more money. So she had money off him and then she was started to blackmail him because she put two and two together and knew that he was actually killing prostitutes in the area. 
normally, if somebody knows somebody's a serial killer, they are so frightened that you would expect them to report it to the, to the police and get protection. You wouldn't expect them to go and live in the house. And she actually lived on the farm with a known killer. On his arrest, police questioned Picton about the scores of women who had gone missing in the area. He proved to be sly and uncooperative. Police often use the tactic of showing a suspected murderer a picture of the victim, um, or even, you know, the actual weapon that they found that was used. Um, this is supposed to provoke a reaction in that person, to show that they recognise this individual. Um, this is totally absent when it comes to psychopathic killers, particularly at the level of Robert Picton. Um, there's just not a glimmer. These are objects. These are vague memories of people that they've, they've abused. Um, for them, they are objects. It probably would be more likely that he'd recognise one of his pigs. What I want you to do from what girls that you remember have ever been up to your place? I don't know. There's so many people coming out of my place, I don't know. Has so she ever been to your class? Her name's Mona. She's pretty. Like I like to sing. To me, it's totally revealing of the way in which this man views women, views uh, his victims purely in objective terms. Um, he's not actually trying to be clever. It, it's how it, this is. Ab that's an absolute classic statement um, from somebody who assigns this type of role to his victims, the, the victim as object role. Despite being shown a picture gallery of missing women who were presumed dead, Picton didn't show a flicker of emotion. This lack of emotional response is one of the reasons psychopaths can beat the polygraph. His crass comment about one of the victims being pretty clearly demonstrates he was playing with the police, enjoying the power he held over them by refusing to confess. But sent back to his prison cell, Picton must have known the game was up. Police officers were combing his farm and finding both DNA and physical evidence that demonstrated that many of the missing women had been there. Discovering that he had a talkative cellmate, Picton began to talk himself, not realizing he was, in fact, speaking to an undercover Canadian Mountie. As a measure of how concerned the police were when they finally arrested Picton, that he might use his influence with certain officers to avoid prosecution, they put an undercover Mountie into the cell with him in order to try and draw out some sort of confession. The recorded interview still shows Picton being very defensive, not revealing very much, but ultimately just revealing too much detail that would actually incriminate him. He's a depraved social isolate. He doesn't have the skill set to kind of have normal dialogue with someone else. You could see him struggling with that. And the things that he does say which are that, that um, incriminate him are, are fragmentary and, and reluctant, gained with reluctance. Incredibly, Picton began admitting to his many crimes very quickly after this Mountie was put undercover in his cell. It sort of shows us that Picton saw it as not even being important, that there were not just 
five women, not just ten women, but fifty or even more women that he'd killed in cold blood. And yet he talked about it in a bragging way. It was almost like he was showing off about the, his life in some way, about his possessions. And in a way, those women were his possessions because he'd ended their lives. So they were his ultimate possessions. This is a so-called cell confession. It's an undercover Canadian police officer who's been placed in the cell with Robert Picton. What are the dangers with this type of confession? Well, the dangers are, is, is this information admissible in court? And that will depend upon um, the, the legislation in different countries. The second one is, is an ethical one. Is, is it right to obtain information this way? And the mood matching of the, the Mountie, the police officer, he uses language, he uses slang, he swears a lot. Why is that mood matching important in relation to Picton? Because he wants to gain the confidence of Picton. He wants to say, I am the same as you. You can confide in me, you can share with me. I am like you. If you're interviewing somebody, you've got to use language they understand. If you're playing the role of a fellow convict, then you've got to talk about uh, a convict in the language that the convict will understand. There's no good you being a police officer or an interviewer. You basically have to go undercover, actually adopt all the characteristics. And that's actually very hard to do, um, to actually go undercover uh, and, and, and adopt that language and talk about uh, sexual behaviour and devi deviations that the police officer may not agree with or may not like. And he's actually got to sell his soul and pretend to enjoy all the deviations and everything else. And in some ways, be more deviant than the suspect. So that in, in a way, it makes the suspect uh, feel more likely to, to ex uh, explain his behaviour, more likely to confess his behaviour, because the guy next to him is even weirder than he is. This very lengthy um, transcript of the conversation between the undercover officer and Picton um, rambles on, but the officer does a very good job of taking the subservient role, allowing Picton to brag, to encourage him. It, it was almost as if he was really um, a petty criminal who was in awe of this killer um, and allowing Picton to take that narcissistic role and reveal more than he should. The way that Picton was drawn out into admitting these crimes was fascinating in itself. We have the Mountie, the undercover officer, uh, challenging Picton almost, saying, well, you know, if I was going to get rid of a body, I'd push it over the edge of a boat into the sea. And Picton cuts in, no, 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 I, I know much better ways of doing that. You wouldn't believe what I did. Bang, he's caught. Five minutes away. I find the best way to fucking dispose of something so I can take in the ocean. So really? You know what the fucking ocean is? You know what I'm If you kill someone and you don't want to be caught, you have to find a way of disposing of the bodies. You get rid of the bodies. And Picton's solution to that problem is quite extraordinary, isn't it? It is. It's about feeding them to his pigs. You would pick up women, usually prostitutes, uh, bring them back to the farm. He would kill them and then 
take them into the slaughterhouse and gut them. Picton actually offers the information that on his farm he has a rendering plant and that that would be an ideal way of getting rid of bodies. It is quite clear that he used the rendering machine to reduce sentient females into offal, into basically pig food. He was just not distinguishing between human beings and the animals from his farm who would also enter there. And what people don't realise is that a, a, a leg of a human being looks very similar to a leg of paw. So you can pass people's body parts as, as, as pig parts. And if, you, if you're if you producing mince or something like that, you wouldn't know whether it was pork or human being. What happened with Robert Picton is we get the colliding of these two psychological motivations, these two distorted psychological forces within him. One is this entirely egocentric, heroic narrative driving him to simply view uh, carrying out the murders as a game, as a challenge, um, with no consideration, no awareness even of the consequences. The other psychological force that we get is somebody who uh, is so completely devoid of any kind of human empathy that he does not see human beings, he does not see people as human beings in any sense at all. Um, hence we get the reference to the bodies as carcasses. For him, these are simply um, objects. Um, with some of the, the most depraved uh, serial killers, what we, the, the underlying narrative we see is one where they assign the role of an object to their victims. Um, we call it the victim as, as object um, underlying narrative. And for these offenders, um, they have no awareness whatsoever of their victims as human beings. Um, they are entirely objects with whom to play. Um, and it's very typical of this type of offender that we see them um, playing with, messing with the, the bodies post-mortem. Um, it's an extension of the fact that they see them as objects. To them, it matters not if the person is alive or dead, uh, only that when dead, they can do more with the bodies. Um, and this um, preparedness to play with the body, to mess with the body, to chop the body up, um, is very typical of this type of offender, this victim as object, underlying narrative role assigned to the victims. By feeding his victims to the pigs, Picton has accidentally stumbled upon almost a fail-safe method of getting rid of bodies. And that's probably the most chilling thing of all, because there's nothing left of them, literally. And he's doing it by using the very animals who make him his living become his accomplices in these killings. Picton slaughtered his victims and fed them to his pigs. He reduced their body parts by putting them through an industrial meat grinder. Picton's pigs foraged so furiously on the human remains that no trace of the victims were left. Even when police forensic teams combed the farm for DNA, little evidence was retrieved. Making Picton's pigs his perfect partners in crime. As Picton's confidence in his cellmate grows, so too does his urge to boast about his crimes. The undercover officer continues to encourage Picton by mood matching his attitudes, his use of slang and exclamations. This not only appeals to Picton's own base communication skills, 
but also to his ego. The undercover officer is quite literally egging him on, and he succeeds because it's not long before the pride with which Picton now speaks of his crimes turns to fury when he reveals the true reason for his anger about being caught. During the conversation with the undercover officer, um, one key element was where they touched on the idea that there were 49 victims. And 49 is kind of an awkward number. We get him talking about being sloppy, we get him talking about numbers as if it were a game, um, as, it, uh, we, uh, as if uh, to achieve 50 victims um, would be a good score in a game. Um, this, is all, this all speaks to me of somebody who, for whom this is just a big heroic challenge and he's showing that he can do it. We got this shocking idea that Picton was angry at the end because he didn't achieve his target, and his target was the big 5-0. Well, that's what he says. His target may have been higher, or perhaps he didn't set a target. You know, 50 has a nice ring to it, but if he got to 50 and hadn't been caught, would he have then wanted to go on to 75? Would he want to go on to 100? So do you think he was just trying to show off to the undercover police officer at that point, his cellmate? Is that what he's doing? He's just literally... A bit of bravado. It's bravado. He's making it up. And, and saying, actually, I'm irritated by this. But he probably is more irritated by being caught. I think he was generally annoyed that he didn't reach 50 because that's quite a big uh, figure. Um, but I don't think he would have stopped. Too much pleasure, too much fun, too much enjoyment. People don't realise that serial killers actually enjoy what they're doing. In America, um, serial killers almost subconsciously compete. Um, the numbers game is one way of competing, and to have the highest number, um, to have a resounding um, death count, um, is, is quite a status thing. And many individuals, many killers, will actually increase the number of people that they are supposedly have killed. And in the idea of having such a high body count, Picton, as a Canadian, wanted to beat the American count. He wanted to go better than those people that he saw himself as being in competition with. Often you can only tolerate for so long killing others. And then your cognitive processes, your decision-making abilities become more confused, more faulty, and mistakes are made. This is classic behaviour. Serial killers start off not very confident, and they have behave what we call behavioural trials. They try out things, then eventually get a situation where they actually kill somebody. Then they start getting quite good at it, and they improve the technique. But it's never quite 100% pleasure. So there's always that little bit more that you need to do to make it right. And that's why they carry on, and they also get faster between the periods when they're killing. But 
where at the beginning they may travel quite a distance and protect them themselves, as they kill more people, they tend to move nearer to home. They're more competent, and often they're more competent as well. And they also know that the police aren't uh, tracking them, so therefore they become more relaxed and then they start to get sloppy. And it doesn't matter what kind of serial killer you look at, you can see quite clearly, as time goes on, they start getting overconfident, and that's when they make mistakes. In 2007, a court found Picton guilty of six counts of second-degree murder. There was enough evidence to charge him for a further 20 killings, but prosecutors decided not to because he'd already been given a maximum life sentence. His police cell confession is a startling reminder of how many murderers can't resist the urge to boast to other criminals about their crimes. But it's also a sobering reminder that the person they're boasting to may be on the right side of the law and that their confession may be recorded, providing damning and irrefutable evidence against them in court. This technique of the police to have put an undercover Mountie in the cell with Peyton is highly questionable. It makes us wonder whether his confessions were drawn out of him under false pretenses, um, and whether this is a method which, you, which is used so often in these sort of cases that is actually viable, that it actually stands up in court. Of course it's resulted in these prosecutions, but we have to question the methods, and we have to wonder whether a person admitting something because it's drawn out of them in a slightly false set of circumstances is the same as someone sitting down and confessing to a crime. The crimes of Picton have had an even wider effect in, within Canadian society because they're looked upon as reflective of the way that the indigenous population have been treated, particularly indigenous females who work as prostitutes. How many of these victims did he really kill? Because it's not even clear to this day that every single one has been tracked down and accounted for. And that tells us a lot about the attitudes in Canada towards the indigenous population as a whole. <laughs> For you, Picton, did we hear anything that could help us towards motivation? Do, do we understand what might have been driving Robert Picton to behave in the way that he did? Not from that clip. No. I, I, I myself felt that we were simply dealing with um, a man in a particular set of circumstances describing to his supposed cellmate why he, um, what he had done. And perhaps that's the difficulty with undercover confessions. You'll get the confession, but you won't get the real reason. Because actually, if the undercover officer then starts to move into that territory, then actually the offender will become suspicious. Who's asking these questions and why? This is getting a bit too deep for just two mates having a conversation. Because mates don't necessarily go into that level of depth. You need to be sort of a, a professional probation officer, psychologist, um, psychiatrist, police officer, prison officer, to begin to ask those sort of questions. 
and therefore the offender would immediately become suspicious because that's not what normal mates do. For this type of offender, there's not necessarily any reason beyond his own entirely ego-driven need uh, as part of this heroic narrative to show that he can do it, to show what he can do. For him, it's um, this is the purest, the, the raw, rawest form of heroic narrative. It's not about anything other than um, Robert Picton rising to this challenge, showing that he can do it. That's why, given the first opportunity, he will want to brag about it, he will want to talk about it. It's all about bravado, it's all about demonstrating his manliness, demonstrating his skill, demonstrating he can do it. There's no other reason for doing what he's done. There are three things, really, which I think um, psychologically are really um, interesting about Robert Picton. One is the uh, absolute uh, assignment of the victim as object role to his victims, the way in which he does not in any way understand their humanity and, and is complete, it has a, an absolute empathy deficit in relation to other people. A second psychologically interesting facet of, of Robert Picton is the way in which he has positioned what he's doing as this heroic adventure, him versus the cops, him showing that he can do it. And we get a number of um, statements within the uh, discussions with the undercover officer which show us that this is how he's seeing what he's doing. We get him talking about being sloppy, we get him talking um, about um, whether or not he can beat the previous score of the victims in America. For him, this is not a, a pain-driven, an anger-driven killing series. It, he's actually excited by what he's doing. Um, he's excited by the possibility that in this him versus the cops um, battle of all battles, that the cops may have DNA. He's excited by that, actually. Um, it ups the ante, it ups the, st ups the stakes for him. Um, and that's what he's all about, this, it, him showing that he can meet this challenge. Um, it's one of the purest forms of disturbed, destructive heroic narratives that I've ever seen. I guess the final thing um, about Robert Picton is his um, absolute egocentricity. Um, and I think that's absolutely captured in the statement that he'll be nailed to the cross. I mean, what a remarkable thing for a serial killer to say, to, to um, in a sense, liken himself to Jesus. Murder on television and in the movies now is, is such a commonplace form of entertainment of putting bums on seats that we sometimes miss the whole point of uh, homicide, brutal homicide, getting down at dirty with it. And I try to get behind that uh, because we do not understand the terror and the pain and suffering that these people cause. And I try to put myself in a bit closer than that, but what I try to think is if it was my partner or my daughter had been invited to a party at Picton's Pig Farm with a lot of other revelers and getting drunk and having a bit of time, quite innocently, having some fun. And then all of a sudden, this man drags her into an outhouse, rapes her, and starts beating her and slashing her and torturing her, probably hanging her up half alive in a barn to die. I don't think any reasonable right-minded person can understand the terror and the fear that this man has done this time and time and time again. We just cannot imagine what it would be like unless we were there, and if we were there, it would be too late for us too. These women to Picton were nothing more than meat. Meat, he can use it in this crude description and recycle it 
and put it back into the community. The man is an animal. He had um, geographic isolation. He had um, a skill set as a pig farmer. Um, he had personal, interpersonal isolation. He had emotional detachment. He had um, failed to acquire either a personal or a social conscience. So those are crucial elements for him that, that enabled him. Uh, I mean, he had the opportunity. He actually set up the circumstances in these raves that they were having um, to, to lure effectively a kind of steady stream of prey for him. So in that sense, I don't know how much of it was a conscious effort on his part and how much of it was just circumstantial good fortune as far as he was concerned. There's this twisted correlation, it seems, in Picton's mind between his pigs and these poor women who suffered so badly. He talks at one stage about being sloppy about how he dealt with their deaths. And it sounds as if he's always talking about his pigs in the slaughterhouse. It's a cold-blooded reference that chills people to the bone. I don't know that he differentiated between pigs and women. Uh, a contemptible capacity to use, abuse, and destroy.